Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for inviting me to take part in this ministerial. And I would also like to applaud my Romanian counterpart and friend Bogdan Aurescu for excellent organization of this meeting. Many important discussions were, uh, many important decisions were discussed, taken, and some of them announced during our conversations here. Uh, new military assistance, including uh, some air defense, armored vehicles, artillery, ammunition, equipment necessary for to um, strengthen our army during the winter, and of course, new commitments to help Ukraine restore its energy system and withstand both winter and the aggression. Throughout my meetings here in Bucharest, I felt a strong commitment and unity. Allies work as one family, crowdfunding everything they can for Ukraine. Many emphasized yesterday and today that the support to Ukraine will continue as long as it is necessary. And uh, I can add only one element to it. This support has to be provided as fast as necessary and continue as long as necessary. I also emphasized that the best way to help the Ukrainian energy system is to provide both spare parts to restore energy system and air defense systems and ammunition to defend Ukraine's energy system from further missile terror conducted by Russia. Today I would also like to emphasize three points. First, many allies participate in the program of training Ukrainian soldiers. Training is indeed very much appreciated in Ukraine. It is a necessary element to uh, make our army stronger. Training is also what differs us from Russians who send untrained conscripts to die in hundreds at the front line. But I emphasize at all of my meetings here at the NATO Ministerial that even the best trained soldier will be vulnerable at the battlefield if he or she does not have an armored vehicle to bring him or her to the spot and if he or she is not supported by artillery, fire and uh, air defense uh, systems. Therefore, training is a good thing, but it has to be paired with the continued delivery of heavy weapons to Ukraine. We need armored vehicles, better those tracked to use them in winter. We need NATO-type tanks, and this decision must be unlocked as soon as possible. My second point is the following. I emphasize that the logic of decision-making when it comes to providing Ukraine with certain types of weapons must be changed. Since the beginning of the war, it has been that a new tragedy on the front line in Ukraine leads to a crucial decision being taken to provide Ukraine with a requested weapon. This applies to the NATO standard artillery, howitzers, uh, to multiple launch rocket systems and some other types of weapons. This has to change. Decisions must be made before tragedies occur to prevent tragedies, not to respond to tragedies. The third element is Ukraine's peace formula presented by President Zelensky at the G20 summit this autumn. We work together with the Allies to pursue the peace formula proposed by Ukraine and convince the countries of the Global South to become part of this overall effort. We will unite the world around Ukraine's vision of peace, not Russian peace manipulations. Finally, we also discussed the issue of uh, Ukraine's application uh, for, membership, for NATO membership. It is somehow unfortunate that it was exactly here in this palace in 2008 uh, when, in our view, a strategic mistake was made by delaying Ukraine's membership uh, to, in NATO at the NATO summit in Bucharest. It is unfortunate because, Ukraine, uh, because Romania itself 
has been and remains an adamant supporter of Ukraine's membership. So we believe, and I made this point clear, that uh, the discussion on Ukraine's application should begin. And uh, we believe that mistakes made in the past can be corrected in Vilnius in 2023. We understand there are still differences uh, in opinions on how to proceed on this, on this particular issue, but uh, discussion has to take place on how to move forward. And we will work with allies towards this end. Thank you, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Let's start with James. James Freddy from the Daily Mail, Foreign Minister, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, just two quick questions, if I may. Um, is Ukraine planning to retake Crimea by force? And do you believe there's a united Western consensus for doing so? Ukraine intends to restore its territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, and that includes everything from uh, eastern parts of Ukraine, Donetsk and Lugansk, and ending up with Crimea. If we can do it diplomatically, so be it. Uh, but uh, we will not lay our hands down until our uh, territorial integrity is restored. And I'm not aware of any ally who can speak against that notion. I think one of the achievements of our continued work with the allies is the acceptance by them of the notion that territorial integrity of Ukraine cannot be questioned. And whatever uh, peace, the eventual peace solution will be, it, have to, it has to be a fair peace based on the idea of, on the on the, based on the principle of respect towards territorial integrity of Ukraine. Next one. The message is simple, give patriots as soon as you can. Because this is the system that Ukraine needs to protect its civilian population and critical infrastructure. This is not an offensive weapon. We appreciate the decision by the federal government to provide Ukraine with Iris T systems, air defense systems. They proved high efficiency. We are expecting new deliveries, as you know. But uh, if Germany is ready to provide Patriots to Poland, and Poland has nothing against uh, handing these Patriots over to Ukraine, then I think that the solution for the German government is obvious. We are ready to accept them. We are ready to operate them in the uh, safest and efficient, most efficient way. And once again, I would like to reiterate that this is a purely defensive weapon we will be working with the German government on this particular issue. Next one. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Uh, you mentioned about decisions on buying weapons and preventing tragedies. Uh, what would it take for Ukraine actually to win militarily? And have you made that clear to the Allies in terms of your weapon requirements? Well, you cannot calculate the exact amount of weapons that you need to win a war, but uh, uh, there was a broad understanding in the room yesterday when we sat down with all allies that Ukraine has to receive everything that is needed to prevail. We in Ukraine do not set any deadlines for ourselves because we know what is at stake. It's uh, the independence and freedom of Ukraine. It is also protection of Ukrainians from torture, disregarding treatment, and uh, extrajudicial killings conducted by the Russian army in Ukraine. So when stakes are so high, you cannot limit yourself in resources needed to defend yourself and to restore your territorial integrity. The most important thing for me is to hear from, was to, for me to hear from allies that they are ready to stay by us as long as it is necessary. And as I said before, I add only one element, be as fast as the situation requires in your assistance. Uh, 
Mr. Sir, my name is Pablo Gutierrez with Major Story News. Uh, NATO promised a robust package of aid, non lethal aid. Um, is there a concern that uh, this package will arrive in time? We're talking about generators and uh, supplies needed to repair the electric grid. And secondly, um, is there a concern that once these facilities are repaired, um, Russia could uh, target them again. Uh, Ukraine is a vast country. Is it possible to uh, uh, protect all of its uh, infrastructure? They will. They will attack uh, pieces of our critical energy infrastructure, both the existing ones and the repaired ones. And this is why we are talking about the need for air defense and energy spare parts to walk hand in hand. Uh, at the same time, there is a broad understanding, and I appreciate it, that while we all are aware of the fact that Russia will continue its attacks, this is not an excuse not to provide Ukraine with necessary assistance, because we are talking about literally unbearable conditions for civilians. Last week, when uh, Ukraine was blacked out, for more than 24 hours, uh, you know, I had my own experience when I came back to my apartment with no light, with no water, with no heating, and the entire street was blacked out. Uh, I shared it with, uh, I shared this experience with, with colleagues and I told them the lesson that I learned over these 30 hours of life without light and electricity. Uh, and I would like to remind that in some places in Ukraine, people live, like in Kherson, people live without light and water, had lived you know, without light and water for weeks until Ukraine liberated these territories and is now restoring systems. So, yes, Russian attack is an imminent threat, but it doesn't stop anyone from helping us to restore the system and keep it running. This is uh, a daily miracle conducted by our energy workers to keep the system functioning, to give light and water to uh, civilian population. Uh, on your first question, yes, this NATO package called comprehensive assistance, yeah, comprehensive assistance package, uh, NATO Secretary General is in charge of running it. He assured me that um, he is making every effort to help uh, Ukraine receive everything we need as soon as possible. Well, I did not notice anyone here at NATO uh, being, you know, delaying, delaying the deliveries. But some deliveries are more complicated than others. I can tell you that bringing a transformer to Ukraine is probably, logistically, is probably even more difficult than bringing an air defense system simply for technical reasons. So all of this has to be carefully thought through how to arrange, arrange this project, uh, this, uh, this uh, transfer. And uh, in the last 24 hours, I have received a number of messages uh, on my phone from fellow ministers who were texting me, we found these transformers and we are dispatching them immediately. We have accumulated this number of generators and we are doing it. So I see a lot of compassion and a lot of willingness to help, and that's inspiring. Hello, Karina Matlinski, Antenna 3, CNN, Romania. I have two quick questions, please. Because you are uh, talking about the transformers. We have a hub here in Romania, in uh, Suchava. Over the 100 uh, transformers and generators will leave to Ukraine in the next uh, days. I uh, wanted to ask you, what are uh, the urgent needs? Do you have any numbers? But you said already that you need air defense more than generators, right? And the second question, uh, Ian to uh, Stoltenberg told that uh, Ukraine have to take it step by step for adoration. And the first step will be to win this war. You said you need quickly to go into NATO. How do you comment this? How do I comment what? On this. How do you comment on this? Because you have to win the war to get into NATO. Ah, to get into NATO, yeah. yes. Um, well, we answering your first question. The, actually, I do have a table of for all the items, or major items that are needed, and, uh, but I don't remember the numbers, and forgive me my ignorance. 
Uh, but I think that generators count in thousands, transformers count in hundreds. Uh, I don't think there is any big energy facility in Ukraine that has not been damaged by a Russian attack one way or another. And running an energy grid is, uh, is a very sophisticated art that requires a lot of commitment and a lot of different spare parts. So um, all of this is needed, but transformers and generators are definitely the items which uh, make it to the headlines and everyone is focused primarily on them. Uh, with NATO, <clears throat> we will win this war with the help uh, of uh, allies. Uh, we will become members of NATO, but it doesn't mean that nothing should be happening between now and the moment of us becoming a member of NATO. This does not happen in a day. So that's why I'm talking about the need to launch a discussion on, uh, uh, on how the uh, application of Ukraine will be handled. There is a certain process involved, and we don't have to sit with our hands down and do nothing until uh, we, win, we win the war. And finally, on, uh, I would like to thank the government of Romania for being a very committed neighbor and friend of Ukraine. We discussed some very specific issues with your foreign minister yesterday. And uh, I have no doubts that this support will continue and we'll always, we will always remember that. A couple of last questions. Uh, John, John Irish from Reuters. Um, I believe you saw Rafael Grossi here yesterday. Um, on the Zaporizhia protection zone, what does it involve exactly and how close is it to becoming a reality? And you just mentioned the need for NATO's tank, tank style as soon as possible. Um, what is still blocking certain powers from giving you those tanks? Rafael is doing a, a good job. We sat down with him yesterday and uh, we both agree that uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has to be protected and to achieve that uh, Russia has to withdraw its heavy weapons and its military personnel from the station. So we will be uh, considering ways how to achieve this goal and uh, Rafael will uh, be doing kind of a shuttle diplomacy between, between Kiev and Moscow on this. Uh, but I, will, I also brought uh, the attention of uh, Rafael to the following matter. Or I brought the following matter to the attention of Rafael. Um, <clears throat> As a result of um, the most recent missile attack by Russia, all our nuclear power plants had to switch on the emergency mode. And uh, the point here is that you do not necessarily have to attack a specific nuclear pl power plant itself, because the damage inflicted because these power plants are part of the electricity grid. They produce electricity that is then transmitted into the system. So when Russia destroys the Ukrainian energy system, it also poses direct threat to nuclear safety and security of each and every nuclear power plant in Ukraine without hitting them directly. So the issue of nuclear security is much broader than just uh, the situation at the Zaporizhia. Uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, Mr. Grossi understands that. His team has vast experience in this and uh, this matter is also on his radar and uh, we have... Uh, Russia has to stop missile attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure uh, and this will not only save civilians living in Ukraine from unbearable conditions of life but it will also save the world from uh, potential nuclear incidents caused by these missile attacks. We have a couple of Ukrainian media here, so maybe you have questions. Irina? No? Okay, then I think at least we finish. Yes, thank you all. Stay safe. Bye-bye.